Good morning. Uh, today's video is about Manifest Destiny and the settling of the American West. And the first topic is going to be Manifest Destiny. And this was a topic that was used in the 1830s, 1840s, and I would argue that you can even find Manifest Destiny as late as the 1870s, 1880s, but its high point is definitely going to be the 1840s. Uh, Manifest Destiny, it comes out of this idea of romanticism, uh, the same romanticism you find in art and music and in literature. And it was this belief by Americans that they were put here on this continent, on North America, to spread Western European ideas, to spread democracy and Christianity. And I like to simplify it by saying God said, go West. Uh, these ideas are going to be spread to the people whether they like it or not. It doesn't matter that the Native Americans have their own form of culture. It doesn't matter that the Latin Americans that are part of Mexico at the time have their own way of life. The United States is going to put their way of life on somebody whether they like it or not. There are multiple presidents that run on this idea of manifest destiny. And with the discovery of gold in California, uh, Manifest Destiny moves into like overdrive. Where are they going? Uh, they're moving to the Pacific Northwest. They're moving to California. And then there are some that are moving to what would be today New Mexico and the American Southwest. Going to the Pacific Northwest is the Oregon Trail. It is a... 1500 mile, I believe, trail that goes from Independence, Missouri to the Willamette Valley of Oregon. And almost 100,000 people are going to use the Oregon Trail to uh, move to a place they've never been before. The California Trail is going to leave from Independence, Missouri as well, and it's going to go out to the gold fields of California. And something like a quarter million people are going to move to California looking for gold and trying to make their fortune. And then last but not least, you got the Santa Fe Trail, which goes down into what was then Santa Fe, Mexico, today, New Mexico. And that's going to be the primary trade route between Mexico and the United States, and there are going to be some cattle ranchers who move down into that part of the world as well. So these three trails, they're not the only three, there's several others, but these are the main three trails that are going to be doing that moving to the West Coast. <clears throat> Where are they not going? They're not going to the Great Plains. At the time, it was known as the Great American Desert. Uh, if you've never seen Nebraska or Kansas or Oklahoma, just close your eyes, imagine a bunch of grass and completely flat land, and that's what you get. And when American settlers first came upon it, a lot of people didn't think you could settle there because there were no trees and the ground was so hard. A couple of people do stop and they try to make a life of it, but it's very hard. It's not until the invention of the steel-tipped plow by uh, John Deere that people start to move there in any appreciable number. Because that was the least desirable place for the American settlers, that ends up being where most of the Native American populations are going to be lumped together and thrown which is why you find so many Native American reservations in Nebraska and Oklahoma and Montana and places in the middle of the country. <clears throat> now, some of you may have seen old Western movies. So you're familiar with the gunfights, the cowboys and Indians, the saloon, ladies of the evening, uh, outlaws. And that's Hollywood. That's not how it really was. For example, you would think that everybody dies from a cowboy versus Indian shootout. Uh, in reality, 5% or less of the deaths can be attributed to uh, Native American causes. In fact, most people moving west never saw an indigenous person, and if they did, that indigenous person it was just as likely to help them as they were to hurt them. So what made it so dangerous moving west? There's the unknown, first of all. There's the journey itself, and then there's disease. There's cholera that comes from dirty water, scarlet fever, which is an advanced form of, um, oh, what's it called? A strep throat. Starvation, because you don't eat enough. Accidents. You break a bone and you get an infection. There's nothing to cure you. And dysentery as well. 
thousands upon thousands of documented deaths and even more undocumented deaths from people moving out west. The most famous of these groups that are moving out west is the Donner Party. George Donner was a farmer from Illinois, and he and his family decided to move out west. <clears throat> um, they gather an expedition, meaning uh, almost 100 people are going to decide to move west with the Donners. And their trip is doomed, as I have here. Uh, first of all, they leave way too late meaning that when they get out west, there won't be any grass or anything for their cattle to, to eat. They don't pack the right things. They pack fancy food instead of just survival food because the Donners are a little bit wealthier. They think that they can eat better. So they end up bringing not enough food because the food that they do bring is going to go bad earlier or be heavier. They get to near what is Salt Lake City they decide to take a shortcut. They're convinced by this person who's just trying to sell maps that there's a new route to get to Oregon. And then they decide, let's skip Oregon altogether. Let's go to California and try to get some gold. Well, by the time they get to the Sierra Nevada mountains, which are where California and Nevada meet, um, it's like late October, a winter storm hits that is out of season, they get snowed in, they get stuck for weeks, and they start to eat each other. Yes, they start to eat each other. And um, by the time it's done, only half the party is going to survive. The other half have been made into dinner. This is a video called All the Mistakes That Doomed the Donner Party. It's by Weird History. I highly suggest that you watch it because it's going to go into more detail about the Donner Party and everything that they did wrong. All right, the second part of this moving west thing is Texas. Mexico gets its independence from Spain in the late 18 teens. After the Napoleonic Wars end, that's when Mexico makes its move and is going to get that independence from Spain. After Mexico gets its independence, it wants to increase the number of settlers and it's going to open up its lands in the northern part of the country to American settlers. Today, Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona, New Mexico, California, those places are all part of the United States. They were originally part of Mexico. Now, the people who are going to be invited in to live in Mexico from the United States, they're told they cannot have slaves. Mexico is a slave-free country. They must convert to Catholicism, that's a requirement, and they must pay an import tax on anything brought from the United States. These American settlers, they say, we don't have slaves, we have lifelong indentured servants. They say, yeah, we'll convert to Catholicism, but they actually don't. And then they say, um, yeah, we'll pay a tax, but they never do. And when the Mexican government starts to crack down on these conditions, the American settlers are going to rebel. By 1835, the American settlers, led by Sam Houston and Austin, Stephen Austin, are going to declare independence from Mexico. The most famous part of this rebellion is going to be the Alamo. And today, if you're from Texas, remember the Alamo is a rallying cry. Everybody's proud of it. But here's the real story of what happened. The Alamo which is this building is just a small part of, was originally a Spanish church, a Spanish mission. And when the Spanish were kicked out, Mexico got its independence. It turns from a Spanish mission into a government building, basically a provincial capital. The American settlers, who by this time are being known as Texicans, take over the Alamo. They kick the government out and they take it over and they challenged the Mexican government to come back and take the building. The Mexican government, led by dictator Santa Ana, will come back and attack the Alamo, and of the 250 Texicans inside, 200 of them will die. Some famous people like Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie, they all die there. 
So yes, it's a heroic act. It shows the the um, dedication of the Texicans to the American ideals, but it doesn't really change the fact that they were breaking the law and they took over a Mexican government building. All right, so the Texicans will declare independence in 1836. Sam Houston is elected president. The fighting lasts about two months, and um, the dictator, Santa Ana, is forced to sign a treaty when he is humiliated. To make this even more complicated, the Mexican government no longer recognizes the, the power of Santa Ana, and so his treaty that he signs is not agreed to by the Mexican government, even though it's the Mexican dictator who signs the treaty. Now, the ultimate goal of Texas was not to be an independent country. It was to become part of the United States. So after Texas wins this battle against Santa Ana and they have this peace treaty in hand, they go to the guy who was president at the time, Andrew Jackson, and say, hey, we want to be part of the United States. Andrew Jackson, if you remember, has plenty of other things going on. He's got the species circular thing. He's got the deal with his wife. He's got the Peggy Eaton affair. Um, he doesn't have time to deal with Texas or Mexico. And he wants to make sure that Mexico won't declare war with the United States. On top of that, the anti-slavery movement is starting, starting to gain steam. And if Texas became a state, it had to become a slave state because of the way the compromise of or the Missouri Compromise was written. When Martin Van Buren becomes president, he doesn't do anything with Texas, and the president after him doesn't do anything until we get to James K. Polk, and it's James K. Polk who decides, yes, we'll let Texas in. So Texas becomes an independent country for over a decade. A lot of people aren't aware of that. Finally, when we get to 1845, uh, President Polk is going to send somebody to Mexico to try and negotiate a purchase of Texas, even though Texas says, hey, we're an independent country. Mexico didn't really recognize that. And when the American negotiator finally does speak to the Mexican government, there are some details that have to be worked out, such as where is the boundary of Texas? In the end, they disagree over where the boundary is. James K. Polk says, you know what? This was already part of the Missouri Compromise. We're going to take it anyways. And the Mexican-American War lasts from April of 1846 to February of 1848. It doesn't go well for Mexico. It ends with American Marines basically knocking on the front door of the Mexican capital saying, hi, we're here to take you. The resulting treaty, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, is what gives the southwestern part of the United States to the United States. So if you ever wondered how the United States gets control of Utah, California, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, it's through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. All right, one last topic is immigration. And these are just some numbers that you might find interesting. Uh, immigration to the United States, it stops during the Napoleonic War. From 1776 to 1815, there is an almost net zero immigration. Uh, you got the wars of Napoleon, the French Revolution, a bunch of war, uh, people who can't go back and forth, blockades, um, embargoes, everything. But after Europe, kind of puts itself back together, immigrants start coming to the United States in large numbers. By 1825, you're getting over 10,000 per year. By 1830, you're getting almost 25,000 per year. And if you go all the way up to the 1850s, 1860s, you get more than 3 million uh, in that decade. So immigration goes pretty quickly once Napoleon is defeated in 1815. Where are these immigrants going? They're going to New York City, just like they would today. Uh, on average, you had 40 ships a day coming from Europe. Uh, the catch is, though, there's no Ellis Island. There's nobody there to welcome them to the country. The ship docks on the shore. They get off, and they just kind of melt away. 
The first true immigration office is not set up until 1855, and that's the immigration office at Castle Garden in New York City. And all the Castle Garden immigrant officials did was they recorded the name, where they came from, and where they were going. That's it. So who were these immigrants? Two very large numbers or groups are the Irish and the Germans. The Irish start coming over in the late 1840s because of the potato famine. Uh, most of them are poor farmers. Um, they move because the potatoes get sick. And I know it sounds cliche or hyperbole or um, stereotypical, but the Irish actually did base their entire food economy on the potato. By 1850, something like 200,000 Irish are in America. They make up almost half of all foreign-born residents of the United States. They're almost 100% Catholic, and they settle by and large in the American states of Massachusetts and New York. You get some in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, but Boston, New York City have larger Irish ancestry than what Ireland does itself. Germans are really going to come over in the 1840s because of a failed revolution. Uh, there's a set of revolutions in 1848 in Europe. The German revolutions fail. Uh, basically, uh, Germany didn't exist. There were dozens of small kingdoms, the largest of which was Prussia. It's spelled like Russia with a P. Uh, some intellectuals from Germany got together and they offered the king of Prussia the crown of a united Germany. And the king of Prussia says, absolutely not. Because if you give me the crown, you could theoretically take it away. If I want the crown, I'll get it myself. When news of this comes out, those German princes and kings who would have been replaced were kind of angry and they start to track down people who they thought were revolutionaries. So a lot of those Germans start moving to American or to America who were involved in this revolution. And by and large, they were middle class, upper class, wealthy elites. And so they have money to move. And while they do come through New York City, they don't stay there. They're able to move further west because they have the money and they're going to settle in places like Wisconsin, Illinois, and Minnesota. Some other groups. You do still have British coming over. Uh, the British are going to come over because of industrialization. You have a lot of Scandinavians. Um, I have some pictures of of Rockford, Illinois. Uh, I have family that lives in and around the city of Rockford, Illinois. And there is such a large Swedish population there that there's a Swedish school system. There are Swedish churches. There are Swedish restaurants. There's a Swedish health system. Uh, there's a Swedish a Scandinavian cemetery. And uh, Swedish is the second or third most spoken language in the area. Uh, one last group you get are Chinese. Uh, Chinese come to California, and Chinese are going to be used to build the Intercontinental Railroad. And then eventually they're going to be used for mining in gold operations as well. This brings a lot of xenophobia. If it's a word you haven't heard or you're not familiar with, that's the basically the fear of foreign people or foreign, foreign ideas. And some of the things that are going to come up with cause this are just people being different, different languages, different cultures. A big one is the idea of uh, Protestantism versus Catholicism. There were people who actually thought that the Pope would take over the United States. And this becomes such a big deal that a political party is created. This political party is called the Know Nothing Party. And the Know Nothing Party, they swear they will never vote for a Catholic or a foreign-born candidate. The Know Nothing Party does not exist anymore, but it does join with a larger party, and I'll talk about that in the next video. And then uh, one last piece of xenophobia. If you're not familiar with who this is a picture of, this is Karl Marx. And Karl Marx comes up with the idea of Marxism. Uh, he's the one who comes up with the idea of workers of the world uniting and overthrowing the upper and middle class. And there were real fears that with all these German people and all these Irish people coming in, who may or may not have been exposed to Marxist ideas, that there would be a Marxist revolution. 
And we don't ever get that Marxist revolution, but what we do get is organized labor. And it's a little bit outside our class, but it is important to know that labor unions and people arguing for better pay and better working conditions are definitely influenced by Marxist ideas. All right, 20 minutes of lecture. I hope that's not too long for you. Uh, keep in mind, we are getting to the end of the semester, so if you haven't been keeping up with these videos, please do so, because everything on your final exam is going to be from a video that I have shared with you. And as always, any questions, send me an email. I'm here for you. We'll talk to you soon.